want to speak to you tonight on the topic, the role of Christian parents. What are Christian parents to be doing? You know, someone has said insanity is hereditary. You get it from your children. <laughs> well, I don't really think that's true. But uh, sometimes we can feel like that in the midst of raising our children. And you hear parents say, these kids are driving me crazy. <laughs> well, I don't think that's true either. But I understand the frustrations that sometimes come in raising children. But I believe that the Bible is very, very clear. And I believe that the best pattern we have for parenting is God. Because the scriptures say that by faith in Jesus Christ, we become the children of God. So if we can figure out how God parents us, we will have the best model possible on how we are to parent children. Now I know that some of you uh, are perhaps single adults. And right now you may be saying, well this doesn't apply to me because I don't have any children. Well listen, the people that do have children need a lot of outside help so I hope that you will consider yourself a helper to those who have children. And some of you are a little older, like me, and you don't have children at home anymore. And you may be saying, well, this doesn't apply to me. It's too late for me. Listen, if you've ever had children and you now have grandchildren, they need you. <laughs> so I hope that uh, where, whatever your status in life, uh, that tonight you will, you will listen carefully and ask God to help you understand how you might help parents who now have children still at home to raise those children in a godly way. So let me suggest uh, three things to you. I don't know, do I have the little, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, very good, thank you. So let me suggest that uh, the very first thing that God does for us and that we're to do for children is that we're to meet the children's needs. Will you listen to uh, these verses, all of which uh, are referring to God and how he responds to us? The 23rd Psalm, we usually quote this at funerals, but listen to these words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The word want means lack. I don't have to lack, why? Because the Lord's my shepherd. He's going to take care of my needs. Listen to these words. Romans chapter 8 verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? God meets the needs of his children. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. God has promised to meet our needs. Therefore, we should not be surprised when we come to the New Testament and read these words in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8 talking about us. If anyone does not provide for his own family, especially his immediate family, he has denied the faith and he's worse than an unbeliever. I don't know how bad that is, but that sounds pretty bad that we are charged with the responsibility of meeting the needs of our immediate family. And for parents, that is our children. So we have a responsibility to meet the needs of our children as God meets our needs. So let's look at just some of those needs. The most obvious is physical needs. Food, clothing, and shelter. If you don't do those for a child, the child won't make it. So those are fundamental, but I'm not going to camp on that idea because I have an idea that most of your children had something to eat today, and most of them are wearing clothes, and most of them will have a place to sleep tonight. Now, that's not true of everybody. We know it's not true of everybody. There are many people in the world that don't have those things, but, uh, but you're, you're probably doing a good job at that, so I'm not going to spend much time there. The second area where children have needs is emotional needs. Emotional needs. And I want to mention just a few of these. First, and in my mind most fundamental, is the need for love. 
Titus chapter 2 and verse 4 says to, to Titus, who was a young pastor, Paul says, Titus, I want you to get together all the older ladies in the church. I've often wondered, Pastor, how Titus went about that. What would you do, get up on Sunday morning and say, I'd like for all the old ladies to meet me? I don't think so. But he said, I want you to get together the older ladies in the church and tell them that they are to teach the young ladies to love their husbands and to love their children. What? You have to have a class in learning how to love children? I thought a mother's love for children was just natural. What is it that has to be learned about loving children? I believe it's how to express love in a language the child will feel. You see, the reality is that basically all parents love their children, but not all children feel loved. It's not enough to be sincere. We have to learn how to communicate that love. You see, every pastor in this city has had teenagers sitting in their office who have run away from home, and they ended up in the pastor's office, and they say to the pastor, my parents don't love me. They love my brother. They don't love me. Now, I ask you, do the parents love the teenager? The chances are yes. What's the problem? They haven't communicated that love in a language the child would feel. Now, this is where the series of books that I wrote on the five love languages is so helpful. People have, and I spoke on that a few years ago when I was here. People have asked me, Gary, how do you account for the fact that your original book on the five love languages that were designed to help husbands and wives love each other has now sold nine million copies in English and been translated into 50 languages around the world, most recently into Arabic in Saudi Arabia. How do you account for that? And I say, the short answer is God. And the long answer is God. <laughs> but on the human plane, it's because that book addresses the deep human need to feel loved. And if you're married, the person you would most like to love you is your spouse. But the second book in that series was The Five Love Languages of Children. And I wrote that with Dr. Ross Campbell, who's a psychiatrist with 30 years' experience with children. And we took that same concept that people have different love languages and children have different love languages, and we have to learn how to communicate love in the language that child will feel. And when parents do that, the child feels loved. I was uh, speaking in uh, Angola prison in Louisiana. 5,000 men in that prison, and all of them have life sentences. It was an open meeting, and about 350 came to my meeting. And I said, I'd like to explain to you why you either felt love growing up or you did not feel love growing up. And I shared the five love languages. And when I got through, a young man stood up and said, he, I judge him to be in his early 30s. He said, I want to thank you for coming here today because for the first time in my life, I finally understand that my mother loves me. He said, you gave those love languages and one of them was physical touch. And I realized that's my language. And my mother never hugged me. The only hug I ever remember getting from my mother was the day I left for prison. He said, but you gave some of those other love languages, and one of them was acts of service. And I realized my mother was a single mom. She spent, she spent eight hours a day working a full-time job. She kept food on the table. She kept our clothes clean and ironed. Mother was loving me. It just wasn't in my language. But today I get it. And with tears flowing down his face, he got it. Now, what I'm saying is it's tragic that you have to wait to 31 and figure out that your mother loved you. You see, if we can learn as parents how to speak the language of children and speak the right language to each child so that those children grow up feeling loved, when the child grows up feeling loved, then life, life just unrolls in a very healthy way. But when a child does not feel loved, then the child grows up with many internal struggles and the teenage years, the child goes looking for love, typically in all the wrong places. And much of the misbehavior of children and teenagers can be traced back to what I call an empty love tank. So it's essential 
that we learn how to love our children effectively and meet that emotional need for love. But a second need that children have is the need for self-worth. Self-worth. I don't think I have these on the screen. Uh, yeah, I do. Okay, self-worth. Every child is made in the image of God, and therefore, every child is extremely valuable. But not all children feel valuable, because the message that they sometimes get from parents is that they are not valuable. You see, in our culture, we have exalted three kinds of children. We've exalted beautiful children. So we have all the beauty pageants. We exalt beautiful children. We exalt brainy children. So if you make good grades in school, you, you, you get the message, you, you are good, you are worthy. But the poor kid that tries hard and makes C's gets the message that, that they're not worthy. And so we've exalted brains, and then we've exalted just brute power. So if you get out there on the field and you can drive the other man to the ground, then you are important. You are a valuable person. But see, what I'm saying is, what about the children that aren't beautiful? How many of you have ever been on the cover of a magazine? <laughs> yeah, you see, most of us don't fall in that category. And how many of you made straight A's in high school and college? Yeah, not many of us fall in that category. And how many of you have played pro football? Well, I don't see any hands. <laughs> you see, the reality is in our society, we've exalted these people and they get a good message and they grow up feeling like, man, I'm it. But the kids that don't fall in those categories often feel like they're not worthy. And sometimes in our zeal as Christians to communicate to our children that they are sinners, and they are, and they do need Christ, but sometimes we forget to remind them that not only have they sinned, but they are also made in the image of God, and therefore they're extremely valuable. You know, I remember uh, visiting in the hospital a young 13-year-old a young boy, and he said to me when I, he, had, he, was in, he was in the hospital for stomach ulcers, 13. And I said to him in, in an effort to try to find out what was going on, how do you and your father get along? And he said, I don't ever please my father. And I said, uh, what do you mean by that? He said, well, if I get an a B on my report card, my father will say, you should have made an A, you're smarter than that. He said, if I play ball and I get a double, my father will say, you should have made a triple out of that, can't you run? He said, if I mow the grass, my father will say, you didn't get under the bushes, didn't get under the bushes. I don't ever please my father. I knew the boy's father. I mean, he was in church every time the doors were open. I knew what his father was trying to do. He was trying to motivate his son. He was trying to say, if you're capable of A's, then make A's. He was trying to say, if you play ball, give it all you've got. He was trying to say, if you do a job, do it right. Did your father tell you that? If a job's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Yeah, I knew what he was trying to do. But you understand what his son was hearing? I don't ever do anything right. I can't ever please my father. Listen, the time to help a child bring a B to an A is not the day they bring the report card home. That's the day you praise them for the B. Yay, B! It's two days later when you say to that child, you know, Johnny, Mary, uh, you got a B this time. That's great, man. I wonder what we could do to bring that up to an A-. minus. And they're with you. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Yeah, I could do that if it were a B. But do you know you have to put forth some effort to get a D? You have to sign your name at least to get a D. So how about on a D, yay, D! And then two days later talk about how to bring that D up to a D plus. And they're on the road. And the time to teach a child how to make a double into a triple is not the day he gets the double. That's the day you praise him for the double. Yay, double. It's next Saturday when you're out there in the backyard and you say, son, I want to show you something. 
Sometimes you can, you can stretch a double into a triple. You have to run into third base and slide. And if you don't turn your ankle, maybe you'll teach him how to do that. <laughs> and the time to teach a child how to get the grass under the bushes is not the day he mowed the grass. That's the day you praise him for all the grass that has been mowed. Woo, look at all the grass lying down. Man, you did a job here. It's next Saturday, you say, son, this grass under the bushes is hard to get, man. You have to go in and out. But I know you can do it, and you bet he will. Are you with me? We've got to communicate to our children that they're valuable, that they're worthy. We've got to meet the need for self-worth. And then the need for security. Security. God meets our needs, and we rest secure in that. You know, when we are in the hands of God, there's nothing that ultimately can harm you. I was just reading it this morning in my devotional time in Luke 16, I think it was. Or no, maybe it's 12. I can't remember what chapter. But anyway, when Jesus said, you know, don't fear people that can take your life. That's all they can do. Fear God who has the ability <laughs> to send you to hell forever. Woo, Yeah. You see, the, the, I mean, the worst people can do is take our lives, right? I mean, but we're going to die anyway. I remember our son, he was traveling the world over, and, and his mother was concerned about him, and she said, Son, I, just, I wish somebody would you let somebody travel with you. And he said, Well, Mama, look at it this way. What's the worst thing that can happen to me? Somebody could kill me. Now, what would be so bad about that? I would go to heaven a few years before you do. Now, what's so bad about that? You see, folks, when we realize we are secure because our eternal destiny is in the hands of the living God, and because of what Christ did for us on the cross, we are going to spend eternity with God and all those who believe and accept Him. I mean, that's security. We have security in Christ. Now, as parents, we have to communicate security for our children because children are fragile, and they need the sense that, that somebody is protecting me Somebody's looking out for my interest. And can I just throw this out? That the greatest thing a parent, a husband and wife can do, a mom and dad can do for their children to create security is to give them a model of a mother and dad who love each other and who work through their problems and who learn how to affirm and support and encourage each other. And I know that in today's world, you know, half, it seems like half the world is divorced. And I, I, don't, I don't want to condemn anybody that's been through the pain of that because I know it's, it's, it's terrible. But, but listen, folks, we've, we've got to commit ourselves, as Pastor said earlier, we've got to commit ourselves to husbands and wives who learn how to make marriage what God intended it to be, a loving, supportive, caring relationship. And uh, next week I want to deal, Lord willing, with how do we deal with our failures because you don't have to be perfect you know, but, but you do have to deal with your failures. And so let me, just, let me just say, I believe that's the most secure thing, the, the, the greatest thing you can do for the security of your children. That's why I spend the bulk of my time when I speak around the country on marriages, not on parenting, but on marriages, because I believe the greatest thing I can do for the children of this generation is to help their mother and, mother and daddy keep it together. So I want to challenge you. If, you're, if you are married and you are together, I want to challenge you. Don't give up. I know it gets difficult sometimes, but don't give up. There's help. Reach out. You're not going through anything that other people haven't gone through. And there's answers to that, and you can find answers to that. And then children also have not only emotional needs, but they have spiritual needs. We all are made in God's image, and God's intention was that we would respond to his love, we would accept his forgiveness because of what Christ did on the cross, and we would come into his family and be his children forever. And children have spiritual needs. The need to learn about God and in due time to learn to know God and to commit their lives to him. And the earlier they begin to learn about God and the earlier they learn the nature of God, the more likely they are to respond to the God who loves them. 
And that's, uh, that's why it's important when the children are little that we are reading Bible stories to them so that they know who Daniel was and they know the lion and they know, they know all those biblical accounts in the Old Testament and they learn about Jesus and the stories of what he did in his life. And they grow up with this, with this in their hearts and in their minds. So I want to challenge you, if you have children still at home and they're little, read stories to them. And as they get older, let them read stories to you out of the Bible. So Bible study, Bible story, praying together, praying together, praying together <laughs> as a family. You know, would it surprise you if I told you that those of you that are married, not more than 15% of you pray with each other on a daily basis? If you don't count, thank you for the food, amen. <laughs> I, I'm not going to clobber you. I, I'm just going to give you an easy way to pray together if you're a husband and wife. It's called silent prayer. Whew. Here's the way you do it. You hold hands, you close your eyes, you pray silently, and when you get through, you say amen out loud so they'll know you're through. You hang on till they say amen, okay? And if a husband and wife will pray together like that every night, then the kids begin to get in on it. Yeah. And what will happen is if you do that every night, about six months down the road, one of you will slip up and pray out loud. When you do, you break the sound barrier. <laughs> praying together. And incidentally, praying with a child before the child goes to bed is one of the most wonderful things you can do for their security. Because you're reminding them that we're all together and God's looking out for us. I think this also is where the church can help you as a parent. The church can't take the responsibility of meeting the spiritual needs of your children, but they can assist you in that. And that's where all the activities for children at the church, extremely important. So see that your children get in on that. And when they get to be teenagers and say, I don't wanna go to that class, you say, well, son, I understand that, but you're a member of our family, right? Our family goes to church, and we're gonna go to that. I remember my son said, Dad, that Sunday school class is boring. And I said, I, it probably is, son. <laughs> yeah. I said, I know I've been in some boring classes. I said, but we go to Sunday school. I said, you can just decide. Maybe you can make it non-boring if you ask a few questions, you know, or say a few things, you know. And I said, you know, someday when you get to be older, you can decide if you want to go to church or not. But I said, now, you know, we're part of the family. Our church goes, our family goes to church. So we meet, we seek to meet their spiritual needs. Then the next thing that we do, the next thing that God does for us and we do for our children is we discipline our children. Now, children may not like this, but it's for their good, right? Listen to these words, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 8. God's talking to us. My son, I'm sure he includes the daughters. My son and my daughter, do not make light of the Lord's discipline do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? And if you are not disciplined, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons of God. God disciplines his children. Why? because God loves us. And we as mothers and fathers are called to discipline our children because we love our children. I know you remember, I remember when your parents were about to spank you for some disobedience and say, this hurts me more than it hurts you. And as a child, you're thinking, you know, mama, don't, don't lie to me, mama. <laughs> but for the most part, we discipline our children because we love our children. But I want to show you the process whereby God disciplines us. And I want to use God and ancient Israel as an example because I believe this is, a, this is the pattern whereby we discipline our own uh, children. The process. First of all, 
God was the great provider. We've already talked about that one. In Exodus chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, the Egyptian, I mean, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. And God said to them, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And I am going to come down, and I'm going to deliver you. God was the great provider, and you remember that when they were out there in the wilderness, God provided food for them every day. And he provided water in the midst of the desert. God was the great provider, and we've already talked about that one. So this is really the starting place of discipline, is that we provide for the needs of our children. But secondly then, God established his authority. You remember in Exodus 19, Exodus 20, if you remember, it's the Ten Commandments. But Exodus 19, God said to Moses, I want you to come up on the mountain. I want to meet you on the mountain. And you remember that when he went up on the mountain, there was an earthquake. And, 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 and smoke going up from the mountain looked like a great furnace. What was God doing? God was establishing for all of Israel because they were all at the foot of the mountain. He said, don't come up into the mountain. You stand at the base of the mountain. Moses only comes up in the mountain. But God was demonstrating to all the people that he was the authority. He was God. Now, as parents, we are placed in the position of authority over children. Three-year-olds are not to be running households. I am amazed at the difficulty some parents have in dressing a three-year-old girl. It's Sunday morning, it's time to go to school, and we pick up, pick up the dress and say, come on, honey, let's put your dress on, time to go to church. And the three-year-old says, no. Oh, honey, grandmother gave you this dress. No. Oh, honey, look at the pretty ducky-wuckies. No. How do you get a dress on a three-year-old? You stuff her in it. It's not that hard. There's one hole for the head and two holes for the arms. It's not that hard. You can dress a three-year-old in about three seconds. And I've seen parents take 30 minutes dressing a three-year-old. Folks, we have to establish our authority. And if our children, as they get older, say, well, that's not right and that's not fair, you need to think about it. But if you feel it is fair, you need to say, honey, you know, I understand you feel that way, but I'm the, I'm the father, I'm the mother, and I have to do what I believe is best for you. So we are in the position of authority. We must establish that early on and continue to be the authority until they are out on their own and they leave. And then after God establishes authority, God gave the rules. Exodus 20, we call them the Ten Commandments. But will you notice with me one thing? That when God gave the rules in the Garden of Eden, there was only one negative. Don't eat of this tree. Everything else was positive. All the other rules were positive. You know, take care of the, the land and da-da-da and, and raise kids and multiply. Everything else was positive. There's only one negative. 